Okay, this is Trophy Gold, uh, Hester's Mill, session three. I want to do a quick recap of what happened last time, and then we will find out where Rasay was last session, um, and uh, we'll go from there. And then we'll also talk about uh, Blaine's absence as well, because we don't have Blaine today. So last time, the characters found the road to Hester's Mill. It was the middle of the night. They split up. Uh, Rissay went scouting ahead, and then Diane and Korkaluk encountered the Black Fang Stalker, this sort of large wolf man beast. And they hid from the Black Fang Stalker um, and then made their way to the camp, which was, there was a camp set up along the road. They discovered that the camp was empty. They also didn't find Rissay. They searched the camp for a time, but then encountered a bear. Uh, they managed to defuse the bear situation. Uh, the bear, in a, in a pretty cool moment, the bear shared a breath with Korkaluk as, as a way of saying thank you for helping because uh, the bear was injured. And then the bear trashed the vagrant campsite. A little later, Diane and Korkaluk went to the shrine. Um, they began searching the shrine but that was interrupted when the Black Fang Stalker showed back up and they had to hide in the shrine. And then they had an extra problem <laughs> of a, uh, a sort of half crow, half tentacled monster is, was living beneath the shrine and started to come up from a secret trap door beneath a, beneath a, a statue of St. Hester. Um, it sort of pushed the statue aside and was coming up. And so they had this creature coming up from the bottom. They had the Black Fang Stalker on the outside of the shrine. And Diane had the, there's a lot of details in between, but basically what happened was Diane uh, switched his mind with the Black Fang Stalker and took over the, the body of the Black Fang Stalker, used his form as the Black Fang Stalker to destroy the crow tentacle creature, which I think we named. Did we ever name those? I don't think we named them. You did, Hester's Bane. Oh, Hester's Bane, that's right. I just didn't write it down. <laughs> uh, the Hester's Bane. And then, um, and then basically, Diane inside the body of the, of, of the Black Fang Stalker ran off and the person who had gone into Diane's body was a man who was not giving up any information, but he sort of uh, warily camped down for the night with, with Korkaluk in the shrine. And then while while Diane was roaming around in this Black Fang stalker form, he witnessed that, um, that titanic crow creature in the nest of tentacles feeding the little crows that Rissay saw in her, her vision or in her, her time travel, you know, time shift from the first session. He saw that creature atop the mill building uh, of the village. So he saw that creature there and it saw him, he thinks, and, uh, and then basically he kind of blacked out at that point. The next morning, Diane went back into his regular body, um, but not before realizing that he was tearing out of the body of the Black Fang Stalker. He was sort of, he was sort of being born anew. He ripped through the body of the Black Fang Stalker and he was a sort of just a man covered in viscera and gore. And, um, and that's when he switched back to his own body. They went and found that man. It turns out that man is the vagrant who set up the campsite. And he is a jerk. Um, he's not nice at all. He's, he's just very, very arrogant, uh, very haughty for a, for a, a vagrant. And um, also I think we discovered that he was wearing nicer armor than should be worn by somebody of his station. But in any case, he keeps saying that he's there for, he's there for revenge. He's there for, to like, to get some kind of revenge, but he won't say what, and he doesn't want the help of any of you. And, um, and that's kind of basically roughly where we ended, if I, if I remember correctly. Brian, did I forget any big details there? Um, uh, only that uh, 
we know there's a underground space below the the shrine with the ladder heading down that we have not yet. Right. Heard. Yeah. You, that was kind of what. That's where the last I heard. That's like the next thing you got, you guys wanted to do. Now we have to account for Diane's absence today. So I'm saying that because it's the middle of the day, it's a new day, relatively safer to be on the road. Diane, for whatever reason, is going back to the ruins of the of the keep in order to investigate possibly communicate with that woman he found trapped in that in that box buried buried in the ground um he's going to go do that and i think we will shortly rejoin with rose at this point too so it'll be corkaluk and rose but we have to find out what rose was doing during that time and so we're going to do what is a an old apocalypse world trick called a love letter where basically i i it essentially what it is it's like we take a big lar large piece of fiction and boil it down to a single die roll <laughs> basically to see how it turned out for you uh you'll have a couple of choices to make though so i think what happened is you saw the black fang stalker approaching rise before it got to them and I think you, you were kind of, you were kind of, you were kind of cut off to where you had to, you ran away, but like in the opposite direction of the group. And so you went a little further down the road, but actually you kind of went more into the wilderness, not so much on the road. And you stayed there for a time, but then you encountered the Black Fang Stalker again, but it was Diane this time. You just didn't know it was Diane, but it was a Black Fang, you just thought it was the same Black Fang Stalker. And I think you got twisted around in the, in the wilderness and kind of ended up like off the main road in your attempt to escape from the Black Fang Stalker. <clears throat> and so we've described that there are basically three more big places to go here. The village itself, this sort of like very intact farmhouse and then uh this this gallows hill right i think that you would have i think you would have like basically i'm gonna let you choose like did you accidentally end up at the farmhouse or did you accidentally end up at the gallows hill um i'm gonna give you kind of a whichever you choose i'm gonna give you like the basic layout of what you found Okay, uh, I think I would have probably steered clear of the Gallows Hill um, in, in search of something a little more comforting, so I probably would have headed to the far farmhouse. Okay, so you end up at the farmhouse, and now I'm going to give you a hunt roll. And the hunt roll is going to determine the normal things, like you'll, you'll get, you know, you'll get your, your, your token and all that, but also it will determine, like, the quality of information you find out about about the farmhouse so go ahead and uh we'll build a hunt roll you can kind of tell me how you're doing it and then and then get a second die if you're exploiting a skill or a piece of equipment um i'm running away from the black fang stalker right that's how you ended up there yeah <laughs> at this point do i know where Corkluck and dion are not I at no not at this point i, mean, I think i think i think you will in the, in the morning, the following morning, you'll be able to hook back up with Corkaluk at least. But for now, you you don't. You're just kind of running. Right. Um, I think um, I might be using my tracking to try and get their trail in case they went here. Um, so Got I've it. like I've run off, and now I'm like investigating the farmhouse to see if Find there's any signs of them or some of them. other person hanging yeah. out. Yeah. I love it. That's great. Go ahead and roll uh, two light dice. I got a four and a two. Four and a two. Um, so, so you get a hunt roll token. Go ahead and mark that. And let me give you the basic layout of what you found. So the farmhouse is actually about a half mile north of Hester's Mill. Um, unlike everything you've seen so far in the land of Torrens Bend, this farmhouse is still standing and it's largely in pristine condition. 
the paint's a little faded, but it is, um, it's still very much intact. There are um, cornfields that are not growing as wildly as some of the overgrowth everywhere else. They're a little more neatly ordered. And there's a scarecrow implying that maybe someone is upkeeping this place, right? The farmhouse itself, I think you, I think you discover that you don't actually see any tracks. You see, you see some tracks near the rows of corn, but it's unclear when they were made. You don't really see any tracks in and around the actual house itself. But I think you go to the house and you don't discover anyone there. You go inside the house and you discover that apart from being a little dusty, it's actually fairly well kept. Um, the furniture's intact, the beds are soft, the, um, there's even like a little supply of like dried food, you know? Um, this would be an excellent place to, to make camp, basically. Um, it's fairly defensible, it's in good shape, and uh, out of character, I will tell you that if you spend the night in the farmhouse, you get to lower your ruin by one. So that's just something to be aware of, especially if you are uh, higher, <laughs> if, you, if you have a few ruin marks. Um, so you kind of just discover that this is a, uh, as best you can tell, a safe place. I guess the next question I have is, so you got a four. Did you spend the night in the farmhouse or did you spend the night in the wilderness? I think I would spend the night in the farmhouse because okay. of the black fanged stalker. <clears throat> right. It is rel it's relatively defensible. I think, in general, you get the benefit of the of the ruin decrease, um, but not this time. Um, if you've gotten a six, I'd give it to you. Uh, not this time, though. I think because you, for whatever reason, your dreams were very, very troubled um, last night. Uh, you just it was a rest, a very, very restless sleep. Um, whatever you were dreaming about, who knows they fade the next morning, right? But nevertheless, you woke up to the, um, you know, to the sound of wind chimes on the porch, um, to the smell of, <clears throat> of rich soil, you know, and, and in a comfortable straw bed, um, you know, Maybe if your traveling companions were there, you would sleep better just because there's a safety in numbers, who knows. But in any case, it's, it's still a good space. You just had a restless night. But you have your hunt roll token and you have the lay of the land here in the farmhouse. So I think at that point, you probably cut across to get back to the road. And, and that's when you see two very interesting things. One, you see, you see Diane heading away. You see Korkaluk there at the campsite. And you see the man in your time travel experience who is giving orders to everyone. Uh, that's the person at the vagrant site. You recognize him. And if you hear him speak, you recognize his voice as well. So let's just have that scene with the two of you meeting back up, and I think we'll kick off from there. Uh, just to clarify, is the vagrant gone now, or is, is no? He he's still, still at the campsite. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's still hanging. Around. He doesn't want to talk to you all, but he's 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 kind of basically telling you all to leave. But he's there. Cool. Um, He'd given us a pretty lengthy uh, diatribe about how much he disliked the various sisters. Yeah, he's very much very very heretical. Yeah. Um, so I guess I would be coming down the road and uh, 
as soon as I see this vagrant who I know to be more, uh, I'll, I'll hasten my pace because I want to warn Corkaluk because I don't know exactly who this man is, but um, yeah. he's been involved in dark things. A hundred years ago, presumably. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I would not expect him to be alive, A, uh, and I don't trust him. So uh, I'll sort of like hasten uh, my descent down the hill towards the camp. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Corkluck, when you see uh, Rose coming, what do you do? Well, uh, I've been chatting up or attempting to chat up this uh, sort of stubborn vagrant and uh, I'm just glad to see Rose back. Um, you know, starting to feel a little lonely out here in the, the woods with this strange man. Um, so, uh, what? I will say to this uh, vagrant, because I st still don't know who he is and I'm still trying to get his name out of him, I will uh, say, let me introduce my traveling companion, Rose. And then gesture to him, sort of enticing him to uh, stick with some formalities. He sees you and he says, he makes no greeting whatsoever and says, why do you look familiar? I should ask the same of you. Um, I thought I saw you once, but surely it couldn't be you all these years later. All these years later? I think I'll sort of like, look him up and down. Like, how, how old does he look, even? Okay, mm, it's 50s. Okay, was Late he 40s. in his 50s when I saw him before? Yeah, he looks the same. Okay. Um, I think I'll sort of, like, step in front of Corkaluk and, like, between the two of them and say, how long have you been at this camp? Uh, let's do a hunt roll. I think you're, you're asking sufficient questions about the world, I think, here to justify a hunt roll. Um, vigilance, possibly, would be a good skill. I can see that. Protection, maybe, because you're, like, interrogating him, presumably, yeah. to make sure he's not a danger. Um, Unless you have any other ideas. But no, that jumped, makes sense. Jumped out to me. I got a five. Five, nice. Uh, take your hunt roll token. He says, I remember you now. You were there. You were there during the attack. I remember because I didn't recognize you. And I thought perhaps that you were somehow a servant of the enemy. But then you were helping us fall back. And so I thought perhaps you were just some... Well, some low-ranking member of my, of my forces that I would have no reason to know at all. And yet you have stuck in my memory. <clears throat> I'm Lord Galdron. Well, that's what they called me. Uh, I think this is sort of surprising me because it didn't occur to me that what happened to me was more than a vision. Like, I... I knew it felt so real that I thought I was there, but it didn't occur to me that I actually could have been. Um, so I think I'll just sort of ask, like, how long ago was that? This is, in truth, I don't know. I, I must confess that my days tend to blur. I know that most of my men were killed and that I ran far away in no particular direction. And I was taken in by a group of very strange people, people who I, their manner of dress and their manner of behavior was even more vulgar than the peasants of Hester's Mill. But they took me in, and I believe they made me one of their own. I have dreams, dreams of a baleful moon. I don't know what they mean, but I dream of it frequently. 
And then I found myself here, back in my lands. And my desire to take revenge on the creature that destroyed everything I had burns intensely in my heart. I think at this point I'll turn to Corkaluk and say, you didn't tell this man anything, did you? I'll just like act as if he's not even there. Uh, as I, Corkaluk, have been listening to this conversation, I take one of the twigs that kind of makes up my facial hair and twist it into like an upturned eyebrow, sort of uh, the like, huh? uh, expression. Um, I have not told him anything. Uh, he's told me very little, uh, but he, we, what you don't know yet is that we fought uh, this, this crow-headed tentacled beast within the shrine and there may be more underneath and uh, this man seems to have some skills in destroying them and so I thought we might be able to form some sort of allegiance. Poor look, I, I don't think this man is worth our time. Whatever skills he has are not worth sullying our reputation by associating with him. He's I would remind you both that I'm still here. I'm aware. <clears throat> Please, let us, she has the right of it. Let us be done with this association. Let us be gone. Let us be parted from one another. As Go with your friend back in all your came. time. You, in all your time here, you've discovered nothing which is efficacious in, in destroying these Crow tentacle. Creature. All my time here, I have but arrived. Mm. All right, well, away we go. All I've ever seen this man do is run from them. Ouch. <laughs> he definitely gives you like a, a, a intense uh, glare for that. And he just warns you again I recommend you head away from the village like your friend if you know what's best for you. All right, shall we turn and head back to the path? Uh, I turn to Corkluck and say, I recommend we head towards the village. <laughs> Let's go and we'll sashay off arm in arm. Cool. I'll see uh, the way to skip. Um, I'll remind you that you are still in the road to Hester's Mill set, which has a set goal, discover the secret history of Hester's Mill. And, um, you will pass the shrine on the way. Did you want to go back to the shrine or do you want to just head straight to the village at this point? I do want to go back to the shrine because I want to know what's underneath it. Uh, uh, to warn you, Rase, there's probably at least one more of these beasts living underneath because I heard noise. I didn't go down. I just... Uh, Hester's Banes. Listened, listened and heard one of these Hester's Banes. Uh, uh, I heard the similar sounds below the, the shrine. So I don't know what we're getting into in terms of uh, a struggle um, and whether we can survive it. I think seeing Lord Galdron here still alive today, despite the fact that he is, in my opinion, like nothing more than a coward, um, would actually embolden me. So I, I think I'd feel a little bit braver and be fine going towards this shrine anyway. Maybe refreshing what the shrine looks like. This is mostly for Jen's benefit. It's a small building about the size of I described it as like those little sheds they sell at Home Depot, <laughs> like the little, those little small buildings. Right. Um, very tiny, uh, just a few little uh, prayer pedestals inside, and then a statue of St. Hester. And the statue of St. Hester is posed in the same way as the statue of, now you know, of Lord Galdron uh, at the crossroads, where her arms are crossed across her chest, but in her hand, is um, a sickle and um, and I think I said it was a cornucopia, possibly a shaft of wheat, I can't recall, but anyway, some, something like that. Um, Lord Galdron's statue was an intentional mockery of her uh, by forming, by, by placing himself in a similar position with a sword and a sickle, right? And we know that it, that statue can be moved and beneath it there is a trap door with a ladder that goes down to a a, a subterranean space or a basement type space. So, Corkaluk, you know the lay of the land. What do you do? 
uh, if I recall correctly, we had to move the statuary to access the trapdoor. You right? do, yeah, yeah. You just move to the side. So uh, we'll light one of my torches again. So we've got a, a light source ready and uh, set that down. Shove the statue to the side. Uh, pop the hatch and sort of poke the torch down in there. See if we hear anything. If we get any reaction from a light source. Yeah, it, uh, give me a hunt roll. Since you're using the torch, you can take two dice. Mm -hmm. A four and a one. You're muted right now. You get a hot roll token, but you encounter something terrible. Oh, let's just go straight for it. You pop open the hatch and you see inky blackness, darkness, and you move the torch toward the darkness and it doesn't get any less black or inky. <laughs> and that's because the space is filled with a Hester's Bane that like launches itself out in between you. And um, it's just, so it's like a five foot tall half, it's like a crow head and a crow body, but the lower port and some little stubby wings, but the lower portion is like just a, uh, a mass of tentacles, like octopus tentacles, and it leaps out. It, its eyes are sort of like, uh, they're actually not black, they're like kind of milky, and it just like opens its, its beak and hisses at you and lunges. Um, let's do a combat roll. How are you vulnerable, uh, Corpolek? Well, I'm perched at the edge of a 15 foot trap door hole, uh, or a 15 foot drop through a trap door. Um, right. So there's, there's that, and I've got a beaky tentacle mass in my face that I'm fighting. So I'm all kinds of vulnerable. <laughs> indeed, indeed. How are you vulnerable um, right now, Rose? Surprised, honestly. Yeah, like, I just wasn't ready for it. Yeah, and also I recognize this thing from as like a, a child of that larger monster <laughs> right, that I saw yeah. by then. So I'm just like, oh crap, it oh, has a little shocked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm just taking it back, I think. Nice. Um, go ahead and roll your light dice to get your weak points. I have a four. Four? Five again. Oh, okay. Uh, both of you take up a dark die and we are looking for an eight. Six. Six, nice. Three. Three, okay, uh, hey, that doesn't get any better than that in this situation. Um, you destroy it. Go ahead and um, start the combat off cork look. How does it start? Ooh, uh, I feel like I take a frantic swipe with the torch first, just trying to bat it away, and then uh, second swipe with my ax. Okay, nice, and then, uh, Rase, go ahead and finish it off. How does that go? Um, I've got my bow staff, so I think I'll probably just like some kind of deft flipping it around my hand and then jab it in one of those milky eyes. Nice. So it sounds kind of like Corkaluk, like kind of got it in place by swinging the torch and stuff, and then you just like. <laughs> Um, buried it into its skull. I like that. Um, and I think it's one of those things where like the staff like stays in its skull and it twitches a little bit as it dies, right? Um, and then it just sort of sloughs off, you know, onto the ground. You get to roll eight gold dice. Who wants to do the, uh, the honors of rolling the eight gold dice? I can give us a die roll or two. And you're welcome to do it if you want. I have a bunch of D6s. Okay, go for it. We're looking for sixes. The eight, right? Yep, eight. Uh, two sixes. Two sixes, nice. All right, so you get to... Um, didn't we define one of the treasures, one of the harvest treasures from these already? Like a spiral tentacle or something. Yeah, it's a spiral tentacle. Yeah. Okay, so 
basically you get to um, you get two treasures harvested from the creature's body. They're worth one gold each, and you can either name new ones or have one of them be a spiral tentacle. <laughs> so you can get another spiral tentacle, or you can name um, you can name name a new a new body part to to harvest. Oracle, do you have anything sharp on you? Because I don't. Yeah, I have an axe. Oh, right, an axe. Um, I think it would be interesting to take this thing's tongue. Mm, nice. Got it. Uh, and you can note that in your found equipment, and it's worth one gold. Uh, Corkluck, what do you take? I feel like the the beak, the two halves of the beak, even absent the tongue, might make an interesting like a uh, castanet sort of, uh, <laughs> musical nice. instrument. Nice. I love it. It's delightfully morbid. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Um, yeah, that's great. So the shaft goes down. Uh, there's a ladder um, with the Hester's Bane out of the way. You can see down to the bottom. Um, the, the lid's only like 15 feet down, if even that. And yeah, who's going first? Corkle has the torch. Yep. Uh, but yeah. I don't mind stepping up front if you're not. I will, I will dramatically, you know. Can I put the torch in, torch in my teeth, or you know? You could probably just drop it to the bottom, honestly. Yeah, right. I'll drop it to the bottom and slide down, uh, ready for more trouble. Yeah. So at the, I'm gonna pull it up. Hold on. So this ladder beneath the statue descends into this basement area, and the walls of this area, it's a little bit. In, in space, it's a little bit bigger than the shrine itself. It's probably like maybe twice as big, um, uh, but still not huge, right? But still a little bit bigger. And the walls of this area are painted with, basically with scenes. Um, there's some kind of story being told like that wraps around the whole wall of the room. Um, and then at, the up, up, at one end of the room, there is what appears to be like a secret shrine or a secret worship area. There is a statue of, of a crow, a, a proper crow, a statue of a crow. It appears to be gold or at least plated in gold and it's wearing a crown and all around it are um, half burnt candles or half melted candles. Uh, marks scrawled on the ground. It looks very like a ritualistic space around this little gold statue. And the statue is like, it's fairly small. I mean, it would be kind of heavy, but you could definitely carry it. One person could carry it like on their back, right? Um, it's almost certainly valuable though. Um, so let's start with, let's start with Rase. Rase, what do you do? Um, See, I think I would want to examine like the the features of the crown. Okay. Um, figure out if it's like if it's the kind of crown that might have been like made by someone that just happened to have some of the materials, or if it was like crafted for royalty, that sort of thing. Right. Well, so, so just so I'm clear, the crown is like part of the statue. Like it's it, it was it was like crafted I, onto the statue. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Um. I, I think then I'll just examine the quality of the statue on the whole then. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Um, you're going to hunt roll. Uh, what about the second die? Any skills or equipment? I don't think so. All right, just roll one die. See how it goes. A three. Three. You will encounter something terrible. We'll talk about that in a moment. What are you doing in the meantime, Corkaluk? Well, as an antiquarian with my skills in artifacts and myths, I want to... I kind of got three questions here. I want to know more about the murals, whether and how they tie into this uh, golden crow statue. And then I'm also curious, uh, like we're below a shrine to St. Hester. I'm assuming there's no, well, I'm curious if there's an affiliation between the two. 
Um, oh, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> so, yeah, right. There's a lot yeah. to dig in. Uh, sounds like you're starting at the mural, though, um, which may answer some of those questions, right? So you are, uh, what what skills do we think here? Artifacts and myths. Myths, artifacts, yeah, because you, know, you have a general knowledge of things like this, I think, based off those two things. That makes a lot of sense to me. You could probably even make a case for mimicry in the sense that, like, is the... Because you sounds like you're. It sounds like you're suggesting that like there's a there's a dark connection between Saint Hester and whatever the crow thing is, right? Is that what you're kind of suggesting? And maybe there's well, that, of, or did somebody deliberately build a Saint Hester shrine right on top, top of, of it? You know, yeah. There's a lot of a lot of situations and cultures where you build on top of the conquer yeah. and on top of the predecessors' religious structures. In any case, I think you've got a good justification for two dice. So go for it. Three and a one. <laughs> I am not great with these dice. <laughs> dice are being incredibly unkind to you both. Yeah. And you will both notice a little too late that the torch is not penetrating the darkness of the ceiling. And when you look up, you realize that the darkness of the ceiling is in fact four of these Hester's Banes clinging with their tentacles, hanging upside down like bats. And they dip their heads down and they hiss. <sighs> and yeah, I think y'all are stuck. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's a harder fight against four of them than it is with, uh, against one. Um, a group adds two to the endurance, so it would be an endurance of 10 now to fight to kill them. Unless you want to try to escape, in which case I'll make that a risk roll. What do you think, John? I'm trying to think realistically of how we possibly could escape. And it, I it's it's I think this I think the outcomes are going to be very dire because like you're kind of on their territory and you have to climb a ladder <laughs> like yeah it's not looking great. We haven't but, figured out any weaknesses of these things, right? You have not, no. Okay. Well, it didn't automatically shrink from the fire, and I can't think of anything from my vision that was a weakness really, because it was clearly winning then. It was winning that <laughs> fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Can you remind me, just uh, in terms of trophy gameplay, do you discover weaknesses through through just accident or... You, just, you, just happen, happen, you, you, you either just happen to discover them or you go in town and you carouse and somebody shares the weakness with you in a conversation. Okay. Yeah, they reveal it to you. All right. Fight? Yeah, I guess so. Vulnerabilities seem pretty obvious here, but maybe if you want to tell me a little bit extra how you might be vulnerable, Corkaluk. Uh, you know, they're they're right above me. My precious porcelain helmet stands between me and them, um, <laughs> and I, I'm kind of attached to that thing. I like it. <laughs> so just the general fact that they can drop down on you is the vulnerability. Um, what about you, Rase? How are you vulnerable? Oh, just complete fear. Like oh, one right. of these things I could handle. Um, yeah. But when they're surrounding me like this, and they're more, more like the giant mother bane that I yeah. saw before, this yeah. is like terrifying to me. Here we go. Uh, roll those weak points and see what those look like first. I got a one. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Three. Three. All right, those are those are good weak points to have at least. Um, let's go to the dark dice. We're looking for ten total. Roll a six. There we go. Roll a two. Two. But right. No, but no one or three, so that's good. Um, go ahead and describe how. Just give me a little bit of fiction here, Corkalek. Like you're not getting an advantage on them, but they're not really getting any hits on you. What's that look like? I'm picturing myself entangled by tentacles and you know wrapping around legs and arms and you know try as I might I'm not 
thus far landing a solid hit. Nice. Um, and what about you, Rase? How's this going for you so far? How heavy is the statue? What about the statue? How heavy is it? Oh, uh, oh, you can you can carry it. It's it's right. like a few pounds. And how sharp is the crown? Uh, probably not very. <laughs> I don't think I care. It's dark enough. I think I'll still like <laughs> grab this uh, statue and just like shove it against the ceiling and like try and macerate these things. Oh, nice. Good. A little. Nice, nice. It's not going super well. Uh, I think they will eventually drop down and start to, you know, you're basically like, it's like two on one for both of you, essentially. Uh, let's go to the next round. So uh, someone roll uh, two, dot, two black dice or two dark dice now. Someone roll one. Jen, you take the two dice. Yeah, I was going to say. I got a two and a six. Two and a six. And a four. Four. Six and four is what we need. So did somebody have two, six, or four as their weak points? It's one and three, I won. Right? And Corkalik had three, right? Okay, yeah. good. Uh, yeah, you managed to, you managed to do it. Um, so what... Uh, let's make this a good fight. Um, I'll start with the creatures. I think that they are... They drop down and basically like th they just like they just like snap with their beaks they're just trying to like get at you right and like um it's a pretty tight space and i think that they drop down and they're kind of like on top of each other a little bit you know they're all tangled up in their own tentacles so they're not they're, and they're a little clumsy they're actually like quite clumsy creatures um and so they just usually just by sheer numbers, <laughs> they, they, they tend to overwhelm and, 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 and attack, but, but it's actually a little harder because, because there's two of you. And so, um, you know, they're not getting any hits in, they're a little tangled up in each other. Um, and that's kind of like the situation with them. Uh, Corkaluk, how does your, how does your, your fight go? Uh, entangled in tentacles, I think they pull me to the ground, and as they're yanking on my legs, you'll remember my fragile ankle that I, I had to yeah. repair. I will scream out, no, that's my ankle, and slap an axe through one of them. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, like through its skull, or? Yeah, a big two-handed cleave, like split it down the middle. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, keep going, Rose. Uh I'm going to say one of these things is sort of like, because they're sort of clamoring for us, it makes the mistake of grabbing hold of my bow staff with its tentacle, yeah. and I just like whack it uh, across the wall. Um, <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Um, and then you got you got two more yet. So Corkle, like, finish them off. What does it look like? It's a, just an accidental backswing, really. I was <laughs> back for a second go, and luckily put that axe head right into the skull of the one behind me. Oh, nice, good. And Rose, you got one more. Um, I think this time I'll just drop that statue on one of them's head. Nice. <laughs> it just, you hear the crunch, um, and it just lays there kind of like twitching, right? Uh, let's get 10 gold dice on the table and see how much treasure you get off this. You're able to scavenge here. I've got 10 dice. Sweet. Uh, two sixes so far, and then uh, four sixes total. Wow, okay, cool. You are, yeah, you get to keep naming body parts or just take extras of what you've already defined. Um, a, a good quality tentacle will, will spiral uh, beautifully when cut. Uh, you have the tongues, you have the beaks, and then you've got three more spots for uh, defining, defining harvest harvestable parts. Uh, yeah, what do you think, Corkalook? How about a set of stubby wings? Mm, stubby wings. Go ahead and note that in your found equipment. Yeah. How big are the beaks? Uh, the beaks are like, uh, the, the creatures are only like five feet tall, so they're like that, maybe. Um, so, all right. I think I'll still take two of them with the thought that eventually if I get enough, I can sort of pa fashion them into these pauldrons. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. So you got some beaks. Go ahead and note that with one gold. Uh, it's worth one gold. Uh, Corkalook, anything else? 
I'm going to grab a second set of beaks because if you have one cast in that, you really want two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, and we've got one more gold here, or one more, one more thing to take. I'll grab another beak. Set All well. right. Awesome. Well, with the dangers done, like after you take the time to like kind of tear these creatures apart and set aside their bodies, um, what do you do with the statue at that point that you use to crush the one's head? Do we learn anything from the mural about the... We're going to talk about that, but just in the, in the short term, I want to know what we're doing okay, with the statue. Yeah. I mean, if it's light enough to carry... It is. And it seems to be made of a precious metal. I don't see why we should leave it here. So. <laughs> uh, are you taking it, Rose? Uh, I'll I'll offer it to Cork a look first. Um, oh, I have a feeling this thing is cursed because <laughs> <laughs> I, I keep probing. I keep probing you on whether you're taking it or not. <laughs> That's probably why. Also, it just seems like it's cursed. <laughs> um. I'm, I don't, honestly, I don't know if Rizme has enough uh, <laughs> forethought to really consider curses. I think she's just like, oh, it's gold. Right, so I'll yeah. take it. Um, yeah. I don't know how much it's worth, but. Uh, go ahead and put it in your equipment. It's worth four gold, in fact. Uh, you also take the condition servant of Malfast. I will type that in the chat for you. Totally cursed. <laughs> So here's the thing. I think the way this scene is going to go. So Cork, look, you are examining the the murals, and without any more danger in the room, I you'll get the story. I'm going to give you that. But I think during that time, while that's happening, we're saying maybe you are the you know kind of focusing on the statue. Maybe the statue is starting to have some sway over you, kind of a one ring situation, right? And I guess my question to say is, you originally like expressed like shock and fear related to the large crow creature. Um, but I think that that changes and you start to feel not just like empathy with it, you actually start to feel like a sense of loyalty to it. What, how do you know, what does that feel like and how do you sort of, like, how are you processing that? What's what's going on in your head, basically? I think probably I realize that um, because I see the remains of these creatures sort of scattered about, and I watch as, like, Corkaluk is gathering them and putting them in his bag, and I start to feel a little bit disgusted at that, as if it's, like, desecrating something to take the remains of these creatures and I have them, but like for me, I'm holding them in reverence and I don't know that Corbillac is doing the same. Right. Right. That's good. Yeah. So he, he, he's a, he's a, he's a grave robber. Right. Yeah. That's good. Well, so let's talk about the murals, Corbillac. Um Basically, assuming that you both take the time down here to, to, to suss all this out, you're getting the whole story of Hester's Mill, essentially. They have been, uh, you start at one end and it just tells the whole tale, essentially. And let me tell you the tale. The, the basics of it. There's gonna be a lot of details that I'll have to leave out because of the, um, because of the nature of the, uh, uh, how, how much detail you can get from the drawings, but nevertheless. So basically the known history, the rough contours of the known history are true. Um, what you understand to be true is that the village of Hester's Mill rose up against this heretical, this cruel heretical Lord and overthrew him, right? That's basically true, but it leaves out a lot of important details. <laughs> um, for starters, um, We've, well, we've established that Lord Galdron was kind of a tyrant. Um, he was not just a heretic. And you actually have some evidence from that before because you realize that he was taking like very uh, ruinous amounts of grain from them, right? 
Um, but also he was just a tyrant. The, the pictures show Lord Galdron's men basically hanging the people of Hester's Mill on Gallows Hill when they weren't able to satisfy his desires. You see that you, you learn that he essentially inflicted this regime of violence and forced labor on them. And because they were so dedicated to their saint, uh, he paid uh, special <laughs> attention to them for his, in terms of being just very cruel, right? Another detail that the known history misses is that the people of Hester's Mill were not able to fight back against Lord Galdron by normal means. Um, and they were so desperate to be free of, of Lord Galdron's yoke that they sought the help of, in the picture, a woman. She's depicted as a, uh, a magic woman, a, um, some sort of sorceress or diabolist, something like that. But basically they seek her help and then she uses her talents to contact a greater demon. Uh, which is depicted as a beautiful, glowing, golden crow wearing a crown. And this crow entity, this crow demon wearing its beautiful crown, um, intervenes. You find one of the pictures, it gets a little dark when you realize that at some point, the people of Hester's Mill began capturing Lord Galdron's men and grinding them down under the millstone and then eating the slurry of blood and bone, um, which then later on in the pictures, the people who eat the slurry of blood and bone give birth to the Hester's Banes. <laughs> um, and man and woman alike instantly. And then you just see the Hester's Banes and the glowing golden crow marching on, on Lord Galdron's keep. You see Lord Galdron's keep on fire. But then this, the drawings get a little bit more feverish and a little bit more scary when you realize that the golden crow keeps asking for more sacrifices. And so the people of Hester's Mill begin turning on each other and sacrificing each other under the mill. And this is ultimately what brought the downfall of the, of the village and the entire land of Torrens Bend. And so that is the story. Also, there's some indication that the, the magic woman, the diabolist or the sorceress who brought the golden crow to the people of Hester's Mill, there's some indication that she got away <laughs> and ran away. So that is another little detail that the, that the drawings tell. But that is the secret history of Hester's Mill. That is set goal complete. Do you have any questions about that or need any clarifications? Well, they said a degree in art history wasn't gonna be useful, but. There you go, <laughs> indeed. So yeah, the story is a lot more complicated. Um, and it seems like maybe these demon crow things are, they're obviously still here. Um, yeah, so. So somebody obviously survived to, to paint this. Yes. Um, I don't know, I'm not, it, does it even vaguely seem like these uh, tentacle beasts would have had the dexterity to make a painting? No, they didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I feel like we're done here. Out of the shrine? Yeah. Okay. Let's take a five minute break. All right. I want to take a minute to talk about the two of you a little bit. So last session, we learned that Diane and Korkaluk, basically they came together because Korkaluk believes that Diane uh, either 
either you believe that Diane's your creator or Diane reminds you of your creator or something like that, right? Yeah, his his skill sets are essentially the same as my right. creator. And so I feel like I, in seeking her out or seeking out one of her descendants, um, uh, approached him to see if he was the one or was one right. of her descendants. And he's clearly not, but now I'm- And now you're just stuck. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I'm, I guess I'm curious then how, Rase, how did you get to be connected to this group? Like, how did that go? I had an idea on that, actually. Um, I was thinking that if, I don't know how well known Diane was as like a craftsman before, but if Diane had a reputation then I might, because I'm trying to find the gift that my betrothed uh, craves, so it might might be something that I thought Diane could craft for me if I could oh, convince yeah. him to like give up this sort of wandering treasure hunting life and go back to his craft, um, which might mean helping him gather treasure so he'll like get enough gold to do his work again. But I like it. That's good. So um, that's interesting. So it's almost like, so Diane is very central to the story of your trio then, which is interesting. Um, I guess I'm curious about, well, I guess we'll see as we play, but I guess I'm curious, like, what do you two think of each other? I mean, you know, if you have any thoughts, share them, please. How uh, common are mannequins in this world? Uh, fairly. Um, it's a fairly common thing. It, it's certainly, there's certainly not rare. Um, the, you don't see them everywhere, but, like, it wouldn't be. Everyone in their lives will probably see, will probably see or know one or two at least right so. i think in that case i might i i think i might feel kind of automatically protective of porkalock because like i can't imagine how hard it must be to live life in a body so fragile um and it's someone that is like strong and capable i think i would automatically feel like i had some sort of duty to make sure Porkaluk didn't just like, I don't know, shatter. Um, I don't know. Yeah. And I, I can certainly see me appearing as a bit of a bumbling fool and that I think a porcelain colander is gonna work for a helmet. Uh, Kingsguard probably thinks that's about the most pathetic piece of armor you've ever seen. What is, uh, what's your feeling towards Rose? I'm impressed by her her martial prowess and ability to just disappear into the woodlands and return back the next day with you know useful information and and unscathed by something that would have otherwise terrified me yeah i it's you know the in the setting you two don't have any reason to know this yet i do because i'm <laughs> i'm creating the setting uh along with jesse and our contributors but like the King's Guard in the setting is a big deal. Um, they are, they're essentially like, they're soldiers basically that like go throughout the land. They're, 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 soldiers is not the right way to put it. They're more like, um, I don't know if detectives is the right way of putting it, but basically they, they get sent places to like, solve problems for the crown right that's kind of their deal right the pinkertons uh yeah but but i don't know if, i don't know if it's necessarily that nefarious it's more like we heard you know we heard there's some trouble here at fort Duran, so we've we've come to like stay for a little while and figure out what's going on and help you you know and maybe that means putting down dissent or maybe it means um maybe it means like rooting out some kind of monster or something or whatever but like that's kind of what they do right they're they're sort of elite soldiers of the king and so it's kind of a big deal to be a king's guard and we have seen Rosé's martial prowess uh you know a fair amount at this point and we know why Rosé left right you ran away because of your <laughs> because of the person you're in love with right yeah yeah um so I'm curious, like, Korkaluk, how do you feel about Rase? Like, do, well, first of all, I suppose, Rase, do people know that generally about you? Like... That I've run away? Yeah. Um, 
or why you ran away? I think I probably don't, I don't advertise it, but if someone like directly asks me, I won't lie. Right, okay. So then I guess my question for you, Korkaluk, is like, do you wonder about Rose and her martial prowess? Because like bumpkins like Diane and you <laughs> like don't have this kind of training, right? Like it's not a, it's, it's, that is a fairly rare thing, right? Um, yeah, wonder about, about, well, we each have our own sort of mysterious past, uh, but I wonder about her past and uh, whether she may also have some guidance in helping me find my, uh, the, find the descendants of my creator. You know, perhaps her past experience traveling the world uh, has caused her to know about some other artisans that might be helpful to me in the, in the future. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to kind of talk about some of that stuff. Um, what do we think is next? Sounds like you're leaving the shrine. I think at this point, there. oh, go ahead, Corkle. No. I was going to say at this point, I might tell Corkle look about the farmhouse. Um, since I don't, I don't know what time of day it is right now. It's probably, I was thinking about that on the break. I think the amount of time it would take to sort of field strip the monsters and then study the drawings. I think at this point it's probably late afternoon, not quite dusk, but getting pretty close to dusk. Okay, then I think I'd probably let Corkaluk know that the farmhouse is a safe place to rest when night falls, which is relatively soon. Yeah, that sounds quite appealing actually, given that I spent the last night in a, a shrine with a crazy vagrant tied up in twine, well, crazy Dion body. <laughs> right, yeah. So you can, uh, as I've described before, you can cut across the, un so you have like the road that you found and that goes straight to the village, or you can cut in either direction into the, into the wilderness to get to the gallows or to get to the, um, the farmhouse. Uh, so those are all options. So Cork, look, what do you think? I believe you said it was afternoon, right? Uh, very late in the afternoon, it's almost late. dusk. Okay. It seems like we'll need the time to get to the farmhouse by dark, so I feel like we should go there unless uh, we're saying things differently. Uh, yeah, that sounds good. All right, let me grab my incursion. We'll talk about that. So as I mentioned, it's about a half mile north of Hester's Mill. Um, you're kind of cutting across to get to it, uh, which is um, might save you a little time. I guess it kind of depends, but but basically, it's not going to take you too long to get there. It's a fairly short journey, uh, maybe made a little longer just because it's particularly overgrown and, and kind of treacherous terrain that you're kind of marching through. But You know, it's late in the afternoon. It is, um, it's fairly pleasant. It even feels like it's getting more pleasant the closer you get to the house. You start to feel this, uh, this very lovely warm breeze kind of blowing, you know, against your, against your face. And as you get close to the house, you see that there are rows of, of corn that are in neat rows, like it's maintained that way. And the side of the house, I don't think you saw this the night before, um, per se, but the side of the house is painted with a mural depicting a, a kind of a similar mural to what was down below the shrine, if I'm being honest, but it's a little sunnier. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a very like sunny pastoral scene of of people working the land, right? Um, and I think as you get very close to the house, you start to hear this, um, you start to hear this mewling of kittens and um, 
a mother cat crawls out from under the house um, and you can hear the kittens meowing underneath the house, but the, the mother cat like kind of crawls out and sort of eyeing the two of you to make sure you're not in any kind of danger, right? Um, but we'll kind of quickly go back under the house. And there are wind chimes hung near the porch. There is a jack-o'-lantern near the front door. It's still in very good shape. It's probably sealed with some kind of wax that maintains it. Crooklick, what do you do? So, Rose, you say you spent the night here last night and you encountered no one? Not a soul. And yet somebody's about... Is there one bed in the house? Do you remember? Uh, how many were there, Jason? Uh, there were two. There's basically like a lower level with like a front room, a kitchen, and then there's an upper level with like two sleeping areas. I would relay that information to Cork Look then. All right. It just seems, it seems pleasant and lovely and I, I would be glad for a, a decent rest, but uh, it also seems a bit peculiar that the, the owner of this place didn't return at all last night and seems to not be here right now. I think at this point, I'm, I'm just sort of like, this is not a gift horse to, horse to look in the mouth, you know? Uh, if, if the circumstances were any different, I would agree with you, Cork Look, but we don't have any other better options. We still have a little bit of sunlight left? A little bit, yeah. Um, I believe you had mentioned there were there were some tracks on the ground in an earlier description of the house. Yes, uh, but just near the corn rows, the like rows of okay. corn. Those tracks, uh, and it was just like one pair that maybe got like sunk in some mud that dried out fast, right? Like not like continuing tracks. Oh. And they were like they're like boot shaped. I was about to ask if they were boot or wolf prints or something else. Okay. Um, Jason, you said before that there was dried food in this house. Is it meat or nuts or berries or whatnot? Um, there were dried berries and dried uh, like jerky, like beef. Yeah. Uh, can I grab some of that jerky and uh, leave it by the edge of the porch for the cat? Oh yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, and I think like I think like this gesture is enough for the cat. The cat seems fairly friendly, actually. And she's almost like proud of the kittens, you know, like the kittens are under there and she's got that, she's got that like motherly glow, <laughs> motherly feline glow, right? Um, yeah, she, she's a very, very, very friendly cat. Um, which also indicates that like, there must be someone here, right? Because she would not be socialized to people, right? Doesn't make any sense. And no other obvious footpaths? Like, is there a footpath running to the village or things I like mean, that? Uh, so there, so there, yeah, there is the, the road, the road, like, that's the other, like, it's a, there's a, there's, there's a, basically the road, like, cuts north from the village to the farmhouse, right? I guess my point is, is it as overgrown as, as what we've seen? Oh, um, it is still quite overgrown. Yeah, that has not been cleared. It's like just the land around the house has been, maintained like nothing else <laughs> but give me a hunt roll I, I feel like the questions are getting to we're reaching hunt roll territory here both of us or just one of us uh, just you am i rolling just one die mm, unless you can make a case for a skill or an equipment i've got a five okay So your questions were kind of like about the lay of the land, right? And uh, take your token. 
I think you are I think you see one of the Hester's Banes out in the day. And it's like challenging the cornfield, the, the maintained cornfield. Like it wants to go in and it keeps like prodding its beak between the corn, but something prevents it from like walking between the rows of corn. Is the cornfield large enough we can approach from the other side of it without you know, kind of keep the corn between us and the Hester's Bane? Uh, I think so, yeah. But it appears that the Hester's Bane, like, like it's being stymied, like it can't, you know, um, it, wants, it wants to go into the cornfield and it just doesn't. So Rissay, how do you feel about us trying to enter the cornfield to see if we can even get into it and then also to <clears throat> have it as a, to see what's causing this barrier. Uh, yeah, I think I would agree to that, but cautiously. So what are you going to do? You're just going to like walk through the cornfield or what? Uh, can we physically enter it ourselves? Or are we, you, are you we can, right? yeah. Okay. Uh, you said there was a scarecrow here before, right? I'll you take that back. You can, Korkalik. Rasay cannot. I can't enter the field? Yep. What happens when I try? You just can't. Okay. You, you just physically cannot move, step into it. So like I start walking backwards instead? You just, <laughs> something just stops you. You just yeah. can't go in. Does it feel a bit like your backpack is uh, tugging you in the other direction? That's it, Jason? I'll leave that up to you. Um, I would say that if that were happening, I would not notice that it was centered on that. Um, are you suggesting that out loud, Corkle, to me? Yes, absolutely. I think that uh, based on that gold crown, uh, sorry, the gold sculpture with the crown on the, the crow, uh, you're carrying a totem of the, the Hester's Banes, and we're in a, essentially a field that would lead to a cornucopia. We're in Hester's turf here. And it feels like whatever is preventing the Hester's Bane over there from getting in is also preventing that item in your backpack from entering. All right. Um, I will take the sculpture out of my backpack and then walk back towards the porch and sort of slide it under and poke my head under and tell the mama cat to keep good watch for me. Indeed. And then do you go back to the cornfield? Yeah. No, you cannot enter the cornfield. You actually feel the longer you the longer you contemplate it, you start to feel like revulsion at the idea of going inside the cornfield. Okay. All right. I'm gonna twist my eyebrow up again. And uh what say, how do you feel about I mean, I'm curious how you feel, Corkalek, about this. <laughs> uh, I am, internally, I am concerned about Rissé's uh, allegiances and state of well-being. Um, I don't know what to do about it yet. Uh, you know, I know, uh, I know enough about artifacts and myths to know that they're not all uh, benevolent ones. And uh, I suspect that, I'm surprised she was actually able to set the sculpture down, truthfully. Well, um, Rissé, I mean, so Rissé, you have two conditions. You have the Servant of Malfast, of course, which we know is what's stopping you. Out of character, at least, we know that's what's stopping you from going in the field. You also have self-loathing. I'm curious how the two interact. Does, does being the Servant of Malfast make you feel less self-loathing or, or possibly even more self-loathing? Like, how does it, how are they intersecting? I think it's more one of those things where um, when you don't feel confident in yourself, you're more likely to put yourself in a relationship that's bad for you. So I think 
I'm at a situation where I don't feel great about myself and I don't feel like I deserve Hester, but Malfast is here for me. Oh, good. Good, uh, good, good. And it, it was maybe sort of an accident at first. <laughs> now that I have this sculpture, the longer I look at the cornfield, I like, I start only seeing the rotten corn. I don't yeah. see the golden wheat and whatnot. Um, yeah. That's good. I like it. It's really good. Well, uh, well, so gang, the house is there. It's, uh, there appears to be no one in it still. Um, but what do you do? I'd like to push into the cornfield gently, kind of scout around trying to be gentle to the vegetables. Um, <laughs> okay. that makes sense. I'm not trying to like crash through. <laughs> right. The right. Yeah. Corn <laughs> yeah. Um, it's amazing how much it actually feels like a sacred space in a way, you know, almost like, um, like I imagine like perhaps maybe part of the reason why you're not just like trashing it or, or, or pushing through is because this feels like rarefied ground in some way, right? Some sort of, some sort of holy ground, I don't know if holy is the right word, but it definitely feels like a special place, right? Uh, I'll take a hunt roll though. Okay. A two. A two. You start to hear the beating of a heart coming from somewhere in the cornfield. Bum, 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 bum. What do you do? I want to try and quietly approach it, sneak up on whatever the source is, if possible. I don't need a roll. You get to the center of the cornfield and realize that the scarecrow, the beating heart is coming from the scarecrow, hanging from its perch. Meanwhile, Rase, what are you doing since you can't go in the cornfield? <laughs> um. How did, how did Mama Cat respond when I put that statue near her? Um, bored curiosity. <laughs> I don't think she was too phased by it one way or the other. I guess I'll pull it back out from under the porch and sort of set it next to that jack-o'-lantern and sort of inspect it um, for a minute before just like laying in the grass in front of this peaceful farm, farmhouse and doing that sort of thing where I pretend to be bored and disinterested to see if Mama Cat will. <laughs> right, yeah. But I, I don't know that I have anything to do in terms At least, of until, cor until, until corporate gets happen. back. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm curious, like when you set the statue down next to the jack-o'-lantern, what did you have in mind there? What were you thinking of? Or, or did you, or were you trying to see something in particular or just, was that just a good place to put it? I think that was just a good place to put it. There was some sort of like, I think there was some sort of interesting symmetry to me there. Um, mm. Because if I'm thinking of this everlasting pumpkin as a symbol of the harvest, and then my yeah. statue as a symbol of Malfast, uh, I guess there's some like idle part of me that was like, oh, I wonder if this will do anything. But yeah. no, it's uh, fair. I, I mean, probably I mean, pretty quick. Nothing happens. I mean, the jack o' lantern's not lit or anything. It's just, you know, it's, it's like carved, but it's not, there's no candle in it or anything. But like it's, but it is sealed with wax very well. It'll, it should stay preserved forever. Um, there's no particular interaction between the two of them, but uh, I, I'm not gonna do a hunt roll. I think it's enough just to kind of leave it there. Um, I want to come back to Corkaluk though. Corkaluk, the scarecrow has a beating heart inside of it, or at least it sounds like it. What do you do? I stand up a little straighter. You know something about constructs, right? <laughs> but yeah, exactly. I, I dust yeah. off my uh, gambus on, which remember is braided corn husks. I kind of right. tidy yeah. that a little bit. And I step forward and I say, greeting sibling, I am Corkaluk. Corkaluk am I, traditional mannequin greeting. There's no response. Oh. So you've done a wonderful job uh, uh, protecting these cornfields. There's, there's no response. All right. Uh, does it have legs or is it actually? It's the, it does have legs, yeah, and boots. 
I think that's right. Um, I think I will exit the cornfield and head back towards the house if I'm able. Uh, yeah, you are. Um, and the the beating of the heart gets quieter and quieter as you reach reach the house. So, Rese, there's a a mannequin inside that cornfield. That scarecrow itself has a heartbeat, but it doesn't reply to me. Uh, I don't know why. I think there's a part of me that doesn't fully believe Porkaluk. Uh, I, I think uh, I, I think Porkaluk might just sort of be looking for a friend here. We've, we've been through some sort of scary experiences. So I think I'll just sort of like uh, reach my hand over to either pet the cat if the cat is there or just like mess with the grass. And be like, oh yeah, the cat's the cat's, to, the cat's totally there. Yeah, the cat's like totally. Okay, like, yeah. Then, yeah. yeah. then I'll just sort of like absently pet the cat and be like, that sounds really nice, Corkaluk. I'm <laughs> glad you found someone out there that you relate to. <laughs> uh, I think at this great. point, it's, it's definitely dusk by now, um, and you can see the sort of like the pink, the pink glow on the horizon. So. I love that there's this building sense that I'm just looking for a friend. I'm insisting a bear breathed on my face. I'm insisting there's a scarecrow with a heartbeat in the middle of the field. <laughs> uh, Rose, should we try and spend another, well, for you, another night, for me, a night here in this farmhouse and see how things go? I don't see why not. Um, it's certainly the best shelter we've found so far. All right, let's do it. Indeed. The inside of the house is, as I mentioned before, um, there's basically four rooms, a front room, a kitchen, and then sort of two, it's more like a loft space uh, up a ladder, but, but basically kind of two little divided areas with beds. And it's a little bit dusty, uh, but it's comfortable. And you, of course, found uh, a small amount of dried provisions, which is good. Um, and I suppose, is there anything you want to do while you're here in the house? Or are you just content to rest and rest up, prepare yourself for whatever's coming next? I just want to poke around a little bit on the sense of trying to figure out who lives here. Like, is there a sign that somebody's been cooking meals or... Uh... How are you poking around? I'm sorry? How are you poking around? What are you doing specifically? Oh, uh, like look at the fire, I'm assuming there's a fireplace. Is there, there is. a kettle hanging over it? Is there remnants of recently cooked foods within that? Got it, got it. Uh, let's do a hunt roll. Um, see if you have any justifiable skills or equipment. Um, skills, definitely not. If you have any equipment that might be helpful, by all means. What kind of crazy stuff might be in a backpack? I feel like you're, you're tempting fate by rolling all these uh, yes, single that's dice. Yes, I'm a little worried about, right? Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> you got four tokens. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, by the way, this is a new set, too. Oh. I should tell you that, yeah, now that you're in the house, um, this is a new set. It has the set goal, learn the scarecrow ritual. I imagine that will be hard for me to complete without going near the scarecrow, but perhaps I'm wrong. Uh, not necessarily. You can, if you spend the tokens, you get it, don't worry. <laughs> well, nature finds a way. <laughs> uh, how'd your hunt roll go, um, Corpulek? Are you using- I haven't rolled yet. Uh, torches seem excessive in a house of this size, uh, but it might be worth pulling out some candles, give me a little bit of illumination. Candles be good. Lantern yes. in the house I can just light. Um, I'll take that. I think you can probably find like a half burned candle in there for sure. Yeah. Okay. So Go ahead and roll, roll two dice. All right. Three and a two. You are searching around the house and there are windows. You're looking around and you look out the window and you see the scarecrow there, hanging. You continue searching around. 
you look out another window and again, you see the scarecrow. Then you reach, you go towards the back of the house, looking out another window on that same side of the house and the scarecrow's not hanging there anymore. So to be clear, it was moving around. It was no longer in the cornfield. It, uh, yeah, like it's like you look once, it's there. You look twice, it's there. You look three times, it's not there. Uh, Rissi, I, you know, it wasn't the most conversant mannequin I've encountered, but I kind of feel like this is the Scarecrow's house. Uh, quirk a look. Uh, have you ever met a scarecrow before? <laughs> That's a, a good question now that you mention it. No. <laughs> I haven't either. Um, I've certainly never known one to own property. <laughs> and uh, I suppose I'm happy to be proven wrong, but I'm also just as happy to go with the facts that I have now which are that I have not seen a living soul. So what if, house. like me, that scarecrow was created and then its creator passed away? Or its creator was converted into a uh, Hester's Bane? A good point. But as a mannequin, as a scarecrow, is created with some sort of purpose, yes? Would think so. I would expect that maybe if this is its house, it would probably stay outside to get rid of Hester's Bane and not come inside for a meal or a nap. Believe it or not, it is now honestly just dawning on me that wait a minute, these things have crow's heads and that's a scarecrow. <laughs> I don't know why that just clicked now. <laughs> a little slowing uptake. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, what are you up to, per se, um, at this point? I think uh, I'm trying to entertain Corkalik as much as possible um, until it becomes inconvenient. And the inconvenience here would be having to leave and find somewhere else to stay this late. Um, especially because Hester's Banes are out there, you know? Um, so I think at a certain point, uh, I'll just sort of like leave Corkaluk with that thought of when the scarecrow be outside, and then I'll uh, keep wandering through the house a little bit. Um, I, I guess I'll look around. Like, are there any books or writings here? Uh, yeah. Where are you going up to the? Are you going up to the bedrooms, or are you staying down below for for now? Well, I, I was in here before. Did I observe any oh, sort of right. like yeah. parlor or library when I first stayed here? Oh, no. I mean, there's just, there's basically a front room, which has got just some very simple furniture, the kitchen and the, the loft area uh, that you climb a ladder to get to. I mean, it's a very simple house, but uh, you can take a hunt roll regardless, just to see if you okay. see anything. Um, what about that second die? I don't know Possibly where. vigilance. Maybe, yeah. Maybe case, make a case for vigilance, especially given the heightened nature of the situation now, because scarecrows apparently walking around. <laughs> so um, I think you should take two two dice there. But okay. I'll leave it up to you. Whatever you think. Uh, no, I, I took two, and I got a four. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. Go ahead, take your token. I think... You don't see anything like books or... Um, any kind of... nothing like that, really. I mean, you see some, like, cookery, <laughs> and you see... Um, maybe like an old blanket. There's a little rug on the floor. Um, it's kind of worn. But for the most part, it's just a dusty, mostly empty place. Uh, with just a little, you know, a few pieces of, of 
reasonably intact furniture. Um, and I think you end up in the loft area, kind of searching around there, just giving everything a once over. When you hear a sort of rasping hiss coming from the darkness of the loft. And you will see a yellow humored lurker hunkered down, kind of like hunkered down like it's ready, like it's coiled up to spring and attack, right? And you're in a position where if it even just like launched itself and hit you, you'd both go flying down the ladder to down to the ground. What do you do? I think I'm at this point, um, I'm starting to probably in part because of the servant of Malfast thing and in part just because of sheer inundation, I'm becoming a little numb to the amount of monsters here. So I think rather than like outright run or attack it, I'm going to reach into my pocket for some more of that jerky and see what happens if I just kind of toss it in front of the lurker. <laughs> I like it. Well, this is definitely a risk roll. Um, Brian, what could go wrong here? Um, we don't know what that jerky is made out of. That jerky could be made out of yellow humored uh, lurker for all we know. Uh, she could, you're, is she on the ladder or on the land? I, I think like you've kind of on the landing. You've just, just kind of come up. Yeah. Okay. You're easily get knocked down. Yeah. I think uh, that's definitely in play. I think you could get knocked down and this thing can also get its teeth wrapped around a vital, uh, a vital extremity, <laughs> um, which wouldn't be great. Let's talk about your dice. Um, if you are using, let's, oh, we have the rolls on the sheet now, which is nice. Uh, take one light colored die if the task is something you're skilled at. There's an argument for speed because I can sort of like. Quickly go for the jerky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, the reaction. Like and, yeah. yeah, I think it's a fast, yeah, I think the reaction, I'm down with that. Uh, so you gotta die there. Devil's bargains. My devil's bargain is no matter what, this thing senses some kind of kinship in you because of the servant of Malfast condition. It, it, it itself is not a creature of Malfast, but it might sense that you are, maybe you come from the same dark place that it does. Any other bargains? Yeah, uh, if I remember correctly, this this statue is valued at four gold. Perhaps in your haste to pull out the jerky, you knock that thing loose. It tumbles and you know breaks, and so its monetary value uh, drops down a bit. It's more just intrinsic value at that point, as opposed and, to you know, yes. And your self loathing value. might, uh, given your sort of newfound relationship with Malfast, you might uh, feel a little differently about. Uh, um, what's the word? Disappointing the the being that you've uh, sort of found solace in. Especially the statue, probably out of character, probably has like really interesting implications for like the condition at all, right? Like maybe its power is no longer over you. Who knows? Um, but if the statue breaks, it will be worthless because its value is mostly coming from people who know what it is and for whom it therefore has some kind of symbolic or antiquarian importance. Anyway, those are those are your deals. I'll go for the statue breaking. I have plenty of gold, so. Indeed, indeed. Well, let's have that roll. A six. A six. You succeed completely. Uh, the statue does fall and shatter down, uh, uh, down, down the, down the thing. 
what does uh, what does the scene look like? Like, how do you get the thing to? What are you trying to do? Just like calm it down <laughs> so it doesn't attack you? Like, what are you ultimately trying to do with it? I think I'm trying to feed it and calm it down so it doesn't attack me, but also that'll give me a moment to retreat. Okay, so you're going to leave it up there then. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I don't really have another option. I, mean, <laughs> okay. I, I can't like throw it out the window, can right. I? Uh, I don't think so. No, not without yeah. engaging in combat. So, yeah. um, well, go ahead and describe it. What's it look like? Um, so I, I guess I'll sort of like reach for this jerky um, and toss it quickly and uh, watch as this thing sort of curls towards it and starts trying to pick it apart like it's flesh, but it's too, it's too dried and desiccated for it. So it'll take longer than this thing is used to, even with its talons. Um, and then I'll just sort of like start backing down the ladder, um, but my statue will fall out the back pocket and land before I do, which would alert Corkaluk to my presence returning. And I'll just yeah. sort of like turn and go like this. To <laughs> and I don't know how the statue breaking affects me, if at all, but. Uh, I think you lose the Servant of Malfast condition. Uh, if you keep the shards, um, they are just, it's basically like, it's basically, it was essentially like kind of a, like pottery, like, but like with a sort of uh, gold, so sort of gilded, you know, like um, uh, outer layer. And you, the shards are worth one gold, um, but that's it, so. I'll leave them. <laughs> <laughs> just to be careful. How do you feel? Hold on. Pause for just a quick hot second. So how do you feel once you realize that, like as you lose the condition, like what is that, how do you experience that? What does that look like? How does it feel? I think it'll probably feel like waking up. Like I'll, the, the thing smashes and I'm like part way down this ladder and it feels like my eyes just like opened really wide suddenly and I'm close enough to the ground now that when my hands just sort of instinctively let go, I still land on my feet, but it's a bit of a jolt. And I'll think, I think I'll kind of like look around and realize that my emotions have been tampered with lately. Um, and it'll take just long enough for me to recover from that, that by the time I, I'm able to tell Quark a look about the creature upstairs. Um, it's probably almost done with that jerky. Well, this is a good question. What are you, you going to do about the creature upstairs? It's this is suddenly not a safe place to make camp if you don't do something about it, right? Right. And I would say you're sure you spent the night here last night. You know, um, I would have said yes a couple minutes ago, but now I'm not so sure. I mean, the creature could have just crawled in there in the interim, right? I mean, it might not have been, it might have been safe yeah. last night, <laughs> if not right now. Uh, me, go ahead. A part of me feels like we should try and destroy it and uh, um, still stay the night here. I don't know that we've got a better campsite. Um, I think that's fine, but uh, I think we should be smart about it. Like this thing is distracted for a second, but it knows we're down here. So maybe we can take that moment to like hide or something so we can get the jump on it when it does crawl down. Yeah, that makes good sense to me. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. So I think that moment comes, you see it, it's climbing on all four, it's climbing down the ladder on all fours like a spider, right? Um, with its head facing down as it kind of goes down. And the two of you have been quiet for some time in order to get the jump on this thing. This feels like a risk roll. 
it was Rosé's idea, so I think I want Rosé to do the role, but you're both kind of like in danger because of that. What is the hope here? Just that you jump it and kill it? Is that the idea, Rosé? I guess, yeah. No. What could go wrong, Brian? It's, it's faster than we expect. Yeah, I think that's right. Like, I think you might just have, it might, you might just have to fight it, basically. You may not have to own a surprise anymore. Um, okay, so what about your skill? Vigilance, I think. Good. Okay. And, but Devil's Bargains. Hmm. I think my Devil's Bargain is, My devil's bargain is no matter what, no matter what, it gets something. A finger, maybe a whole hand, depending on how poor the roll goes, that kind of thing. Something gets caught in its teeth. For me or Cortland? Either of you, because you're both in danger. Um, Probably a little better for Corkalek, right? <laughs> I'll be specific. Something of Corkalek's gets in its jaws. That's a terrible devil's bargain. Do you have a better offer? <laughs> um, I I still feel like there. What am I saying? There's something in this farmhouse that we've not located. I don't know how essential that is to our uh, success in this set in learning this character ritual. So part of me thinks that if I'm right, that there's something else here that that becomes harder. Uh, the house gets set on fire or like, you know. Oh, maybe the, the creature knocks over a lantern or something. Right. Yeah, that'd be pretty good. I like that. Um, so the devil's bargain is like, I like, why don't you just, just be specific? Maybe like the house catches on fire. <laughs> Two great devil's bargains, Rase. What do you think? <laughs> or do you want to just roll one die? <laughs> I'm just gonna roll one die. I don't want to condemn Corkaluck uh, or these house cats. So take there take the die. In, in a real pinch, I've used rewind to repair myself in the past. <laughs> Off work at this point. Eh, I'll, I'll still only roll the one die. <laughs> All right, go for it. It's a five. A five. Yeah, um, I think like the fire is still going to happen, but you just have you're going to have a chance to put it out. Basically, um, might be another risk roll. Um, I do want to. I do obviously you can add a dark die if you want to try to roll the dark die and the light die again to try to get a better result. Get a six. No, five is pretty good. So in the fight, basically you, you, you've, you've, all, you've lit a lantern for the night, it gets knocked over, and I think it catches that rug on fire, right? And so you have to, you're gonna have to figure out a way to put the fire out, but you do get to destroy the creature. So what does that look like? Um, can I try and kill two birds with one stone here and try and like whack at it with this on fire rug? <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I kind of, I kind of like that. I think it, I think the danger of the fire is still there, but uh, I don't know if it's a because I think because I think I'm going to require another risk roll for the fire to not be going crazy. Sure. The house. Um, um, in that case, maybe I'll I'll take the lantern okay. that's crashed. Yeah. And since the lantern still got some fire going and yeah. probably some broken glass, I'll just like smash this thing in the head with it. Nice. Uh, Corkleft, do you want to say what you do? I feel like in a, assisting in, in ambushing this beast, I try to, from behind, kind of do that wrestle maneuver where you stick your arms around and get a, uh, is it called a Nelson, I think is the name of the move? I mean, 
or grab nice. the thing in a half Nelson or a full Nelson to uh, hold it steady. Nice, nice. So it's it's burning. You're holding it like its face is burned. It's like it's hissing and like snapping its teeth, trying to get anything it can in between your 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 wrists. As a reminder, the creature is very. It's actually very easy to hold on to because it's quite emaciated and thin and uh, uh, not much. You know, it's got like kind of wiry, springy muscle, but it's not very strong. And just a mouthful of like razor sharp teeth and these big yellow eyes, these glowing yellow eyes. Uh, how do you finish it off for say, once Corkalik has it held? Uh, I'm gonna stomp on it with my foot. Just get right in there, I guess, if he's got it like restrained. Uh, you're muted, Jason. So Cork looks like on the ground holding it. Is that the idea? I can see a scuffle like that. Right yeah, falls so over, but I'm yeah, still... Yeah, so you're kind of like, okay, good. And then you just like stomp its head in. <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice. Cork, look, there's a problem with a fire. Um, the fire is spreading. Uh, Cork, look, what do you do? Is it... The rug, or it's spreading to the house as a whole? Uh, it's on the rug for now, but it is probably going to catch pretty quickly if you don't do something about it. Uh, I want to just grab the rug and, you know, hightail it right out the front door of the house. Just drag the flaming thing out of the building and toss it in the yard. Yeah, yeah, like that. Uh, risk roll. What could go wrong, Jen? Well... Parts of you are made of wood, right, Corkalup? You've got those, like, eyebrows that you twist. Yep. I'm going to say those eyebrows get singed, and for the remainder of the incursion, it's much harder for you to express yourself. I think that you just catch on fire, and you just take a lot of damage. So what about your die? Uh, what skill are you going to use here, Corkalup, if any? Um... I don't know if any of these skills. Are I don't think they do. <laughs> I think I think I'm a going bargain. to mimic the rug is what I'm going to do. Yes. Devil's bargain is all you've got. Um, no matter what, the cornfield catches on fire. I'm going to say the heat of the rug when you toss it out front melts the wax on the jack o' lantern. And I don't know why, but I feel like that would be bad. Interesting. All right. So I can choose between either of those? Yep. Let's find out more about that jack o' lantern. We'll take the uh, melted jack o' lantern damage. Three and a two. <clears throat> Three and a two. I assume you want to add a dark die to risk your mind and body? <laughs> yes. All right. So add roll a dark die. Again? Uh, yeah, you'll roll the light die and the dark die. Okay. Um, yeah. A six. Is it on the dark die? Or the light uh, die? That is on the light die. Okay. You uh, succeed. Dark, dark die is a three. You succeed. Uh, describe how you uh, save the day here. <laughs> Uh, all right. So, um, we'll get a little melodramatic here. As I'm, I'm grabbing this rug and dragging it out, I, I feel like I've got it under control, but also sort of feel a, a need to tidy the place a little bit because we kind of made a wreck out of this house. So I'm going to be grabbing up little pieces of broken uh, bird uh, statue, like gold bird statues, throwing those onto the rug, and maybe like, grab a little bit of ghoul goo and then you kind of yank it all out the door and then slam the door shut and just kind of act like nothing happened. So, and I think the fire catches the, the jack-o'-lantern. The jack-o'-lantern actually, as the wax melts off the jack-o'-lantern, the jack-o'-lantern lets out this ghostly howl. It's like a sort of like, it's like this kind of like, And it actually just like crumbles immediately. And you can see the faint 
the faint purplish glow of residual magical energy just evaporating to nothingness. Should I try to rewind the time and restore that? If you want to do the risk roll, you can. <laughs> also, by the way, per se, uh, there is a trap door beneath the rug. I'm not going to waste any time investigating that. Indeed not. Uh, let's take a five minute break. So we talked about the possibility of Korkaluk doing a rewind to save the jack-o'-lantern from being destroyed. And we also talked about how there's a trap door beneath the rug in the, uh, in the farmhouse. Let's start with the possible ritual. Are you still down with that, Korkaluk? Are you thinking this might, might be what you want to uh, do? I think, no, I think we'll, unless Rose feels differently, we'll live with the consequences of whatever we just did to that poor jack-o'-lantern and find out. I have a, a question for you too that's not exactly related to this, but we're sitting on a total of seven hunt roll tokens right now. Right, um, it's a lot. Yeah, in terms of game mechanics, if I'm correct, if, if we ever roll a one on a hunt roll, we lose all, uh, that player loses all their tokens. That's correct. Is there a way to stash or secrete them? It says you can convert them to, uh, Items. You can spend them one for one for treasure, or you can spend them to get seckles. So, so tell me if this uses. works then. Uh, if I was to, you know, you know, having stepped back into the house, shut the door, uh, realize that sitting on the, the mantle right on the fireplace that I've overlooked before is a, um, a tea kettle that looks quite a bit like the style of uh, uh, <laughs> the work of my creator. I, I like that. I'm very into it. Um, do you want to spend a hundred token for that? Yeah, can I convert a convert a token to a precious little tea kettle? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you can as ascribe whatever story you want to it, but it's only worth one gold. <laughs> so, <laughs> and is it there? Uh, just in terms of trophy rules, I can't convert like three to a three gold item or something like that. Um, I'm I'm okay with that if you are. Yeah, if you want to spend three tokens and you want it to be like a exceptionally interesting item i suppose that's okay uh are you talking about the tea kettle again or yeah i just uh, and also kind of learning a bit more how the rules work in trophy gold yeah 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 uh, normally the way it works is you spend one token to get to find a treasure worth one gold um i suppose if you wanted to spend multiple tokens since you do have quite a few on hand you could uh find an item that's worth three gold or whatever i think that's that would be okay yeah okay let me convert two into this this tea kettle that is uh kind of hinting at my drive well, so two gold is a two gold is a lot for something to be worth uh what oh. is what is so special about this tea kettle well here's my logic is that my drive is to find my creator right and i'm searching for somebody who has that that artistic style right and i feel like i may have just found a piece that was made by her or by one of her descendants Okay, good. So it's like it. So it's just an exceptionally high quality, high quality. No, not exceptionally high quality. Exceptionally valuable in the sense of trying to meet my drive. Oh, I see. So, so if this is going into my hoard later right, on. It's an abstraction of your meeting your drive. I like that. Yeah, I'm into it. Uh, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, I think that's great. Okay. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you can. It's count. It counts as found equipment for now, but um, it is worth two gold ultimately, mechanically speaking. Yeah, Rose, what are you up to? Uh, I think I was going to investigate that trap door, uh, see what's underneath. It. Uh, it's 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 op It opens easily, and it's a ladder that goes down into what appears to be a cellar of some sort. Yeah, I'll, I'll go right down then. Down in the cellar, it's been converted into some kind of workshop. You see piles of straw and burlap in the corner. Um, and there's a table at one end of the cellar. And on top of the table, there is a partially constructed scarecrow laying on the table. It's like half stuffed with straw. Um, and 
there's also some papers and books and things around as well. Do these look like they, are, are these the same materials that I would have seen on the scarecrow? Uh, roughly speaking, one? yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, if you want to do a hunt roll, we can go a little deeper on this, but, but yeah. Sure. Um, do I have anything? Well, the equipment might be the only option if you want to look at your equipment, like the backpack equipment, possibly. If I come downstairs, does my knowledge of mimicry help? I mean, if you want to do your own hunt roll, <laughs> you can, <laughs> by all means. I'm happy to let you take the hunt roll if you want to look, but it's up to you. Um, sure if you have a skill, certainly would, you know, uh, what do you think's better? I, I was going to say that I would certainly let Quirk look know that there's something down here. And given Corkaluk's fascination with the scarecrow outside. Uh, it makes sense that Corkaluk would be looking into it, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it makes some sense. Uh, I like, uh, I, th I think a lot of your skills apply here, right? Uh, artifacts, mimicry, yeah. The fact, just the mere fact you're a mannequin <laughs> might be <laughs> of general use. All right, yeah, it's good to see the, uh the process uh, halfway through, you know, yeah, uh, assembling it a little better understanding of my own self. So I'm yeah, this month, yeah, I imagine this is kind of a important moment for you, right? I mean, in a way, yeah. because it's, you know, it, it's reminiscent of what you're trying to accomplish. So, yeah. Yep. All right, two dice. Two dice. Four and a three. So we're looking at the four. Uh, take your token, but you encounter something terrible. You are searching the workshop area. You see the books, you see these scrolls and books and things. And you see on a shelf where some of the books are there's a glass jar and the glass jar has what appears to be small hearts in it, preserved in some kind of fluid. The hearts are too small to be adult hearts. And so probably they are either like an animal or a child's heart in the jar. But the printed materials is just instructions for how to create the scarecrows and how to do the magic to bring them alive. Sounds like our set goal. And indeed, you both have the option of, you can learn the scarecrow ritual and uh, if you don't already have a ritual related to enlivening things um, or bringing things to life, or if you are not yourself a mannequin, um, then you take that ritual. You have to you have to increase your burdens by one to take the ritual. Otherwise, uh, you get it for free. So you would get it for free, uh, Corkaluk, by virtue of the fact that you are a construct yourself. Um, say your existing rituals are not relevant to this so if for, if you wanted to learn it it would be your burdens would go up by one so but the scarecrow ritual um, essentially it allows you let me read the text
Uh, create a construct of straw and burlap that will endlessly hunt a named target. I'm good without the ritual, personally. I was hoping it might uh, be a fail-safe measure if I ever bite it that you could bring me back to life somehow. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> There are other rituals in the world. Um, but in any case, uh, do you want to learn it? You get to learn it for free, so. Yeah, I'm happy to learn it. Uh, and and I, I think that's, as you said, it's part of our set goal. Um, I'm also curious to say what, what our thoughts are on this, that there is a scarecrow outside. If it's hunting a thing, I don't know what it's hunting. It almost seems more like it's just caring for the house in the cornfield. Well, we haven't seen any of Hester's Bane at the house, so. Well, there was one by the cornfield, and it didn't. Well, no, I mean in the house itself. Oh, I see. Uh, so it's possible it's just keeping those away from here. The notes, the texts that you find, they're mostly just notes written by someone by the name of Beatrix Mandrake. And this Beatrix, oh, sorry, go on. Uh, the notes also include journal entries, essentially, of Beatrix explaining that she has done her best to secure the area, and she is now trying to figure out a way to hold the demon lord there to trap him. And she uses the words to trap him ever dreaming. And so it seems that her mastery over this scarecrow ritual, it, she, she manages, she manages to, she was essentially engaged in some kind of study where she devised the ritual and she used the scarecrow. The scarecrow is used to quote, hold hold him there ever dreaming. I feel like I missed one thing in a little audio garble. Who, who did the journal say this was his targeting? Uh, she just refers to it as the demon. Okay. As a former servant of Malfast, am I like aware of Malfast? I think so. I think you have a you, yes, because you, your sympathies were with that entity that you saw when you went back in time, right? And so you know that's Malfast. You know that almost certainly Beatrix Mandrick is referring to, to Malfast, and that's kind of what's going on there. I think I would relay this to Corkaluk. Um I don't want to leave him in the dark about it any longer. Um, and Thank you. I think I'll, I'll sort of... Uh, eat crow here a little bit uh, and say, it seems you were right. This is not your average scarecrow. It's doing us a service right now. I still feel a bit befuddled. Is, is Malfast trapped within that scarecrow that's in the cornfield? If so, why could the uh, Hester's Bane not reach it? It appears from Beatrix's notes, you will surmise that some magic of the scarecrows is, is holding Malfast at bay, essentially, holding Malfast in a stasis. Malfast is not in the scarecrow, though. Okay, thanks, that helps. And then, I remember, if I remember right, Dion had told us that when he sort of uh, spiritually encountered a woman buried in a box back at the fort, that her name was Beatrix Mandrick. I think that's right. I think she did say her name, yeah. And he relayed that to us, right? He did, yeah. All right, so we know where she's buried. And indeed, Diane's on his way there, <laughs> right? That's the direction Diane headed, so. But the night is growing long. Uh, are you taking the ritual, by the way? 
Uh, yes, I did. Okay. All right, that's set cool satisfied then. And But you uh, can also sleep here, um, and you can recover a ruin if you stay the night. Yeah, let's do it. Get some rest. Yeah. Shoots the the yellow uh, humored lurker's body out of the house. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sleep with yeah. That in here. Then we will have uh, this next sequence be the end of the session. So you are both resting, assuming I assume you're taking watches, or at least you know, um, you know, is, is someone taking watch, or are you just kind of securing the house really well? I mean, I suppose you probably don't even need to sleep, right? <laughs> well, I was about to ask that question. Do we know do mannequins even sleep or do we just kind of like slump over in the corner and look like a rag doll? Yeah, I, I imagine it's kind of the situation where you like, even if you don't need to sleep, you do it just to not unnerve your human companions, right? But yeah, that's, that's what I would imagine. <laughs> um, in any case, I think I... Might at least. Yeah, since Corkaluk never truly sleeps, I think Corkaluk's kind of like always on watch at least in some sense. Um, but in any case, you both can get some rest. But while you are sleeping, you both have dreams. And I would like for you both to make a special die roll called the nightmare roll. Uh, if you'll both please roll a dark die. Four. 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 Two fours. If it's equal to or lower than your current ruin, you are, where are we at? If it's equal to or lower than your current ruin, uh, technically your ruin would go up, but in our case it just doesn't you just don't get any rest, essentially, from the from the night. Or you can take the condition, the birthing dream. Your choice. If I take the condition of the birthing dream, do I get to continue resting and therefore lose the ruin? Then you will lower your ruin still if you take the birthing dream. I wanted to ask my, sorry, go. my ruin was four at the start of the night. Is this happening while my ruin is? Currently? Yeah, yeah, your, your, your ruin is still currently four, right? Okay. Uh, I'll take the birthing dream and uh, condition and find out what happens. So, okay. both of you, are you taking the dream as well, or? Oh, I was going to say I'm not. You're not taking the dream. Okay, so you're you're just okay. So you're not going to get any ruin decrease. Well, Cork look. You have a dream. Constructs dream. Of course, they dream. They're 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 imbued with soul and spirit. You have a dream where you are laying on a bed of sunflowers, and your belly is fat with child, and you're surrounded by beaming loved ones and onlookers. Who are those in your context? Who are the onlookers and the loved ones? Let's see. Uh, uh class of young pottery students with you know, their hands still covered in clay. Oh, nice. What do you fear the most, Korkaluk? Within the context of this dream pregnancy or as? In general, what do general. you fear? The porcelain parts of my form breaking and me being unable to repair them just sort of a gradual, relentless decay of my body, leading to me being unable to locate somebody who can help fix me. And now, Jen and I will offer some details about what it looks like in the dream as you give birth to a manifestation of this fear of you being broken apart permanently and not being able to be repaired. I suppose the first question, Jen, is what does it, what is, what is Corkula giving birth to in the dream? I was trying to think about this. Um, 
I mean, if his fear is being broken, then quite frankly, birthing anything will do that. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, maybe he births something human, which his is... His maker, that'd be interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know, some, something like of flesh and bone, I think would be more disturbing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because he's not that. I like that. Um, what specific person might you be giving birth to, Gorkaluk? Sorry, thinking here. Um, the bear. <laughs> It, it crossed my mind, but it seemed <laughs> quite in keeping with what Jen was describing. Um, you know those dreams you have where your, your teeth are crumbling? Uh, I hate them. Yeah, they're the worst. What if it, it is me giving birth to uh, my creator, Mashiko, but that as she enters the world, she crumbles and disintegrates in a sort of an inorganic way, even though she should be tissue. Yeah, I like that. And I think as she's sort of crawling out of you, whatever that means, um, do you remember what she looks like? Or are you like seeing her for the first time and you just know it's her? Let's go with that. Seeing her for the first time, just know it's her. I think she crawls out of you fully formed and She's covered in the blood and and other fluids of birth all over her, just drenched. And she crawls over to you in this bed of sunflowers and she looks at you and she says, I cannot live while you yet stand. And she just begins to like, she begins to crumble. And she's like giving you a choice. Either you sacrifice yourself for her or you let her crumble away. What choice do you make in the dream? I feel like I'll sacrifice myself for her. Do you destroy yourself? Or does she destroy you? Yeah, I will, will literally disassemble myself and use those parts to reassemble her. Nice. And I think all the onlookers like are applauding as you are like tearing yourself apart and putting her back together. And it would be a lovely, tragic dream in its way if it wasn't for the fact that as your face falls down, the last bit of you, your maker carelessly steps on it and crushes it underfoot, thereby ending the dream. <laughs> There's a, about a 50% chance I'll have an actual nightmare about this tonight. <laughs> And you now have the condition of the birthing dream. This is important. And I think, I think that ends our session. Uh, let's do stars and wishes. Stars are things you enjoyed. Um, scenes, bits of role play, whatever. Uh, wishes are things that you hope to see for next time. I'd like to start. Uh, I will say stars for, I thought the role play was just generally very, very good. I, I really enjoyed uh, um, Rissé's like interactions with the cat. <laughs> I don't know, it just, it felt like a, that whole moment because the farmhouse was supposed to be such a, a lighter moment, a sort of 
a refuge in the rest of it. It was kind of, a, it felt like a very appropriate kind of like thing to do in the scene. I liked that a lot. Um, I enjoyed the quite tense moments with the Scarecrow and kind of what was going on there. Um, and yeah, uh, and the dream thing was really good too that we just did. So yeah, the, the, I thought the role play, a lot of good scenes uh, happening. And I like that we got to explore your connections to each other a little bit too. I know it's something we talked about before. Um, wishes, I am, I am interested in seeing you all get hurt, roughed up a little bit. You all had a really easy session in terms of the combats. And I, the dice were kind to you and I'm interested to see how you all deal with the adversity when the dice are not so kind to you. So I still wanna see you be heroes, but I wanna see you get roughed up. Uh, those are my stars and wishes. I have stars. Um, I really liked the moment where we were underneath that shrine. We looked up and all of those things were there. And I liked that we both kind of were just like, we can't get out of this and we might die. Uh, and it was like, it was very dire and it was quite frankly very lucky that we got out without a scratch. Um, but I, I liked that moment. And I also really appreciated the detail of Porkluck cleaning while he put out that fire. Uh, I just thought that was really a charming depiction of this character. Yeah, I know. It was, it was so, um, I thought that was too, because I, I imagine that scene is a very like hasty, like we have to hurry scene, but he ended up making it this more like, I don't know, like fussy <laughs> scene, which I thought was amazing. Uh, any wishes? Um, for wishes, um, I want to know what messing up that jack-o'-lantern did, if anything. Um, and I also want Cord to look to find a friend. Nice. Uh, thank you, Brian. Any stars or wishes? Yeah, uh, I've really just enjoyed seeing Rissé's persona kind of in my mind, uh, like the the skills are playing to the character the character's playing to the skills obviously this is jen's jen's playing that's doing that but in my head i've built up this this mental image of uh Rissa that's that made that moment with the the kittens and you know pulling out this big gold statue uh, kind of ridiculously tender sort of like this you know gruff capable king's guard just sits down on the porch and kind of you know petting kittens and you know letting the sunlight glint off the statue. It just was a good uh, counterbalance to the rest of that character's abilities. Can we talk about the unintentional, but very, very cool symmetry between the shattering of the statue and the shattering of Korkaluk in the dream? Like just this idea of things being broken and shattered. I thought that was pretty great. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, any wishes, Brian? I don't know if it's a wish per se. Uh, I'm perseverating over whether we should be going to dig up Beatrice Mandr Beatrix Mandrick uh, or whether that's the worst idea in the world. <laughs> I think we're going to find out when we have when we have uh, Diane back <laughs> next time, uh, because I think uh, if Diane is indeed heading to the, towards that direction, I think we're going to learn more about Beatrix Mandrick. So, yeah, but um, we'll see. <laughs> Well, uh, that was great. I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, if you're watching the video, thank you so much for joining us.